nine years ago, with the main reason being the quality of the schools uh, that our children would one day attend. My wife and I were pregnant with our first daughter, so thoughts of elementary school hadn't entered our mind yet. What we did know was that like other professions, there were trained professionals who knew more than we did about education who would be making the best decisions possible. I had always planned on reviewing my girls' schoolwork and did so beginning in preschool through what is now first and second grade. Everything was satisfactory until two things had happened in 2013 almost simultaneously. First was when Allison, my first grader, brought home a book she picked out at the school library called Dude, Fun with Dude and Betty. And yeah, those are my two girls right there. They just had their birthday. They're, they're one year and one week apart, so we always put their birthdays together. So it works better that way. Um, do you have a clicker for the... So here's Dude and his baby. Great book. Um, this is a nonsensical book similar to... No, okay. It's a nonsensical book similar to Dr. Seuss, except this one is filled with surfer slang. My then six-year-old was confused by the slang that is literally in almost every sentence of the book, but we pushed through it. It was at the ending that really had me irritated. After a full day of surfer life, dude and his surfer babe, Betty, I think that's what they call him, surfer babe, Betty, uh, go back to dude's house for some, dan some uh, dancing until his parents come home. The illustrator was careful to draw the parents right out of an old fun with Dick and Jane book to exaggerate the generational difference and apparently how the parents were out of touch. They wag their fingers and smile, asking dude if he did his homework and made his bed, at which he replies, oh, bad scene, time to bail. He and Betty run out the door and finish out their day of fun at the beach with no consequences. <clears throat> I inquired with the teacher, librarian, and principal about why a book would be in the library for my six-year-old to bring home that not only shows utter disrespect to the parents of the story, but has the child get away with it. No one could really see anything wrong with the book, but I was given a form to fill out to have the book reconsidered. The book was then reviewed by a committee for important things such as is the author or presenter competent and qualified in the field? The answer was yes. Are informational sources well documented either in the resource or in the guides? And again, the answer was yes. And are the illustrations appropriate for the subjects and age level? And the answer was yes. In other words, does the book have words and pictures and is the author a human? <laughs> the review was, it, I, no joke, it was, that's pretty much what it was. <laughs> the review was purely academic and did not consider the message of the book, but one question in the appropriateness section caught my eye. Does the resource promote the educational goals and objectives of the curriculum uh, of the, the district schools? And the answer was yes. So the FID, FISD's hopefully unintended goal is to challenge my authority as a parent by allowing books such as this into the schools when my six-year-old is still developing critical thinking skills. After all, aren't parents, are their schools supposed to be safe zones? Bureaucrats want to protect her physically from bullets and drugs, but apparently her mind is fair game. I expect to find books um, as my daughter ages um, that have a variety of content that require her to think. This includes many classics I think we all read as students. But to have this type of material in the school and accessible for my six-year-old puts an undue burden on me as a parent. To be on par with the school's logic, I would expect to see Fifty Shades of Grey in our high schools. So I'll provide back to, to the review and change the ending of the book. Instead of going home, Dude and Betty go to school midday. After Dude strolls into the class late, the teacher asks Dude why he is coming into class so late and, and why he has not done his homework. Dude says, oh, bad scene, time to bail. And again, runs out the door with his classmates cheering him on to finish out his awesome day at the beach with no negative consequences. I received no reply to my email. The second thing that happened was uh, when Jillian, my second grader, um, brought home her first second grade math CBA for us to do at home. Um, does anybody know what these are? Q Q's. Yeah. Yeah. These are, this is how they teach math now. These are ones, tens, hundreds, thousands. Makes sense, right? You know, somebody explain that. See what they are, it makes sense. So, this is how they're taught. Uh, units, rods, flats, and cubes under the premise that children are more visual learners. You know, and I get it. I know there's some truth in that statement, 
The problem is that my daughter has already been learning a number of places and how to add vertically, what they call the algorithm, for at least a year, mostly by me. Uh, there was no option to use the vertical method in her class. She was required to learn these pictographs, which take much longer to solve and had no practical application with large numbers. When I asked her teacher or principal what was going, on, uh, going to happen when the, the children moved to large numbers in later grades, they replied that they expect the students to make the transition to the vertical method. Why not use visuals, um, the visual method only for students who can't learn the classic method and just save some time? And I think there's been a lot of people, Isaac Newton is a good example, of people who learn the vertical method, the, the classical method is fine. Um, my daughter became confused, intimidated, and frustrated with the arithmetic, and I saw her love of learning arithmetic decline to the point where she avoided it. And there are too many things that make me choke up. I guess too. After many weeks of being a part-time math tutor, she's back on track with uh, vertical addition and subtraction and can also use pictographs just to satisfy the test. What frustrated me the most was that she told me when she came home after the first weekend of us working through the practice problems. <clears throat> She said that her teacher told her that she had to use the pictographs. Specifically, she, her teacher told her, I know your daddy told you to do that, but you can't do that anymore. I'm going to finish reading for Doug. These examples and many others led me to connect with other parents and current and former educators in this district and others in Texas to see if it was just me or if there were others who felt as I did. What I have found is that not only do almost all of them see similar issues, but that this has been happening for at least the last 15 years. I hear of lesson plans that are increasingly pushed down from above, leaving the teachers who train so hard to make a difference in the lives of their students reduced to facilitators instead of instructors. I am not an educator. I am a classically trained biomedical engineer with an MBA. I am an avid reader and a lifelong student. I study what we have done, how we behave, and where the money goes and I am pretty good at predicting what is going to happen. Once I get my teeth into a topic, I'm a regular dad and I know when things don't add up. I know that two plus two does not equal five. I know my girls' weaknesses, but I also know their strengths. I keep hearing calls to pull your kids out of public schools if you love them. Let me be clear. And he has this in caps. Private school and homeschooling will not protect your children. For every one homeschooler, there are something like 50,000 publicly educated children. When those 50,000 children grow up, their votes will count as much as that homeschool child's vote. We cannot shelter our children. We must take a stand now. I have three goals this year and beyond. One, ensure that students have the opportunity to be taught to think critically and be well prepared for whatever path they choose in their adult lives. Two, to be an advocate for teachers and protect their roles as educators, not babysitters. Teachers constantly plead for parental involvement. They know that our children will not be successful without reinforcement at home. Three, Engage parents in the education process. If you see something that you question, speak up. Ask your teachers. Ask your parents. Develop a network and have a voice. 
Our children have no voice, and in many cases, our educators have no voice without risking their jobs. There is one last message, and then I'll hand it over. Don't take no for an answer. Always demand accountability. If there are bureaucratic obstacles, then find a way around. Remember that you are the parents, and these are your children. But also remember that you are voters, taxpayers, and you are the boss. And that was all. Thank you, Doug. Students will come through elementary common core mathematics with inadequate arithmetic foundation, making high school experience difficult and sterile. A proper elementary foundation begins with number, including counting by ones, forwards and backwards, then by twos and threes and fours and fives, fluent recall of arithmetic facts. Common Core people may claim that fluent arithmetic fact recall is what they intend by their vague language. But without clear statements, the standards are open to abuse by publishers. Then one of the most dangerous goals of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics will be realized. The original 1987 draft of NCTM's curriculum standards proposed delay of fluent recall of easy arithmetic facts until second grade. When I protested, they improved the goal. But we know these things about fluent recall of arithmetic facts, and this is on your handout. Fluent recall is easily done, and nobody is damaged. There's more detail there. So why does Common Core call for delay? Why are elementary mathematics vocabulary lists so weak? Why no telling time in first grade to the nearest minute? Not hard to do. Coins and their values. Traditional arithmetic processes instead of processes that are complicated and pointless and invented. Is it paper, uh, is it paper pencil work? Or is it calculators? Reading and writing numbers. When does that begin with the thousands and the millions? Without these topical foundations, students are denied participation in the daily use of arithmetic and mathematics. Remember the name National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. Those of you who once had the International Reading Association and the National Education Association on your radar, make room. The National Council of Teachers of Mathematics has long been subversively peddling junk philosophies and practices and undermining effective strategies. One of the worst of the junk has been the impossible quest for a magic learning approach that will cement an idea in a student's mind right away. Cognitive psychologists who scientifically study how people learn, recall, and apply know that each new lesson is but a first draft and that this first draft is efficiently tidied up in subsequent days after sleep has provided natural digestion of learning. To part three, what should be happening. As to methodology, why is there no mention of ongoing review in Common Core? Now, what do I mean by ongoing review? Imagine your basketball coach says, okay, team, Monday's basketball practice is only dribbling. Tuesday's practice is only free throws. No dribbling. Wednesday's practice is three-pointers. Thursday's is inbound plays, no dribbling, no three-pointers. And then Friday, we put it together and make a basketball game. That's ridiculous, but that's how most of the United States learned arithmetic, and that's how they learned math.